Well, Idaho's known as the gem state, and that's it. It goes for lots of miles, to say the least. And the thing that you may not know about Idaho is it has like eight scenic drives within the state. So there is lots of beauty that's to, to be behold that's there. You can see up here is, is Yellowstone uh, sitting on the edge of it in the Grand Tetons and uh, we'll, we'll eventually get there. Where Lanny and I were leaving from was from Salt Lake City, Utah. We'd been staying with a travel club member there for four days. And then we were traveling up to Twin Falls. And I was actually staying with a friend of mine who, who was an extension agent uh, for 30 years in, in that area. And uh, on the way, as we was going through Idaho, you find all this on-farm storage. And we have on-farm storage in Texas, but that on-farm storage in Idaho was everywhere. Every farm had a setup similar to this, and that's a lot of capacity. They said that in Idaho, there's about 130 million bushels of storage on farm. And it's why why do they do that as opposed to what they do in other places, like moving it? Well, like in Texas, we have elevators pretty well where you need them to be with capacity to do that. Up there, they did not have that infrastructure, so the farmers took it on themselves to build the infrastructure. Okay. And so it, 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 I found that interesting. And then after I got to, well, another thing we saw, we kept seeing these plastic buildings out there and th they're just tents and they're about 32 feet long and about 15 feet tall. And you were like, well, what am I looking at? Cause all I could see was plastic. And so when I got to, to my friend's house and he pretty well knows what's going on there, I asked him what I was looking at. And he said, alfalfa alpha hay and small bale. And I, I said, well, what's the plastic about? And he said, well, we sell all of ours to Japan, a good portion of our produce. And he said, and they insist on it being bright, bright green. So the second we harvest it, we pack it off into these plastic uh, sheds until they're ready to put into uh, ship containers. And then they go into ship containers and go across the ocean for feeding out livestock. And I thought, wow, what kind of expense is this? And, and the plastic keeps it green? It keeps it from getting rained on and it keeps the sun from hitting it. And it, as long as it's bright green when it went in, it stays bright green. So it, it was quite fascinating. Is that animal feed or do yeah. they use it? Okay. Yep. And the Colby beef is a very expensive product over in Japan. And um, so they, they want high quality feed for them. And that's just one of them. Now, where we were at in Twin Falls, there's a lot of things that, that's around Twin Falls. Uh, you can see that Shoshone Falls is here. And Twin Falls is right there in the neighborhood. Uh, this is State Parks, Niagara Springs, as well as Thousand Springs. And I'll show you pictures of each of these when I get there. But as you're coming into town, you get off on 93, you're going to see this bridge. And this is from the top of this bridge to the water is 483 feet. And it's the only place in the U.S. that it's legal to do base jump year round. So it's, if that's your thing, you can go jumping off and pop your parachute and go gliding. And I'm just like, okay. <laughs> this is a picture of Shoshone Falls in the fall. Now, if you go in the spring when the snow melts coming, you have a whole lot more water. <laughs> and then as the water dwindles down, then the falls dwindle down. But even in the fall of the year, it was quite beautiful to see. And then the namesake of the town is Twin Falls, 
but it's not a twin anymore. This fall is gone because of the hydroelectric dam. So it's just a single falls, but hey, <laughs> you name, name the town twin falls, you know, you just don't go changing it. <laughs> Uh, then you go between Niagara Springs and Thousand Springs. I, I encourage you to go to both. My friend took me that, uh, that afternoon, and then I took Lanny the next day. This is the water running out of the side of the hill, and it's thousands of gallons a minute, and it drops the air temperature a good 10 degrees, mm -hmm. and it's just pristine water you can drink it no problem it's coming out of an aquifer and it's just flowing this is thousand spring again just lots of water and all this water is going down to the snake river and this is what it looks like it's this rock structure in the background and coming out of this area is where all that water is running out of. now this area this is one of a number of trout farms that come off of the Snake River water because it's pristine water. And this is the largest operation uh, that, that takes place there on the Snake River. They raise 70% of the marketed trout in the United States. 24 to 26 million pounds of rainbow trouts harvested annually. And so when you go there, it's just tank after tank after tank of these fish, and you're just like, unbelievable amount of fish. If, you, if you're a desert person, which I, I'm not, I live out in the desert, and I see all I want to when I'm here, but you can run out to this particular uh, Dune State Park and uh, see, see the dry portion of Idaho. Uh, that's not me. I'm going to show you mountains and lakes. And so that's, <laughs> that's uh, what, what's there. If you want to go to a cave up here is Idaho Mammoth Cave. And it's nothing like Kentucky's. I mean, <laughs> I, even if you come visit me, I'll send you to Sonora Caverns. It's prettier than this. <laughs> but if you want to really see some nice caverns about six hours away from here, it is uh, Carlsbad caverns. So it, it, there's some beautiful cave. But the deal on Twin Falls, the Snake River provided water that was needed for agricultural production. And out of the 500,000 cows in Idaho, 400,000 of them is right here in Magic Valley. And they raised lots of milk. And we made a fast tour and probably saw 100,000 cows in just about 20 minutes. And <laughs> what's in town is a Chobani's Greek yogurt plant. And we saw it right after it opened. And they've already had to expand. And this thing cost a half a billion dollars when they built it. So this is not a little operation, and now it's even bigger. And uh, so that's where all the milk comes from, is all those milk cows. Oh. And so I'm going to head up here towards Yellowstone, and on the way, I saw this sign that said American Falls. Now, I'm sorry. I'm American, and I want the American Falls to be the best thing <laughs> that I've ever seen. And I got off the road, and that was it. And I was like, disappointment falls would be a best, better name. <laughs> it, it was not running water at all. And I it is like, a great picture. I, I was just like, train and... I'm just like, it's just pitiful. I'm just like, <laughs> no roof. I'm just like, ah. Uh. So we're going to head on over here, major potato production over in this area in Idaho has a lot of corn production. They have a lot of potato production. And I, I looked up to see how many acres. They have 300,000 acres of potatoes. And they still set a pretty high standard at 455 hundredweights per acre. So they produce a lot of potatoes there. So there had been a question submitted. Um, 
What makes it so good for potatoes in Idaho? The, the temperature, the water, the, the time frame. Matter of fact, I, I didn't mention it. I'll show it here in a second. But when we went through all that grain storage, I saw wheat like I'd never seen wheat before. So the first question I asked him was, what's your yield on your wheat? Last year's wheat yield for Idaho, the entire state averaged 96.7 bushels per acre, which was a record. For hmm. our area, for Texas, it's 35 bushels. For our area in the Water Valley, it's 20 bushels. So they produce four and a half times more than we do here. Wow. You know, like we, we went by field after field, and I was like, well, what, what's your champion production? He goes, well, we got some guys that'll make 200 bushels. And I'd like to fell off my chair because that's just unreal. And well, do they, so there's a question, do the potatoes taste differently like fresh than when, when we get them in the stores? Not really. They, they, uh, they still taste like russet potatoes and, uh, and the difference, well, they know how to store them well. When I grew up on the farm, we had potato production in, in Castro County. And we'd stick them in a root cellar and eat on potatoes until February. And by that time, they was getting pretty shriveled and, and looking pretty bad, but we were still eating them. And ah, you know, um, so, <laughs> so Jack's brother just got on and his wife, they lived in in Boise, Idaho. And he said the secret to the soil, it was in the chat, is, is that it's volcanic soil. And that, that makes a lot of uh, nutrients, I guess, in it. Patrick, I mean, Jack, you should get our potato. Uh, I have the potato now. I just want everyone to know that Idaho has nothing on Kathleen. She grew <laughs> potatoes in, our, in a pot in our backyard. And who, who asked the question about what's the best tasting? The best tasting is you get the little potatoes and you just pan fry them. You don't do anything to them, but get the little ones like this, cook them, and it will be the best potatoes you've had in your entire life. So, <laughs> you know, farmer lady. We, we so, don't have storage silos. <laughs> Now, one thing as we was driving into Twin Falls was we saw all these, these lava flows that stopped at the Snake River. And so oh. we, were, we were really amazed by all the lava flow there. Uh, but when you're going over here towards this, this eastern side of Idaho, here's an Airbnb that you can stay at. It's one bedroom, one bath. And I just checked, it's $207 a night. And if you notice, no windows. And I was like, if you want to check out what it's to be in a casket, there you go. Just close the door. And it's pretty, pretty weird. And it's, it's there. And uh, then we go on up to Idaho Falls. Uh, it's got some nice man-made uh, waterfalls and, and the, several Mormon tabernacles around as you go around Idaho. And that's, a, that's beautiful, uh, but, but it, it is man-made. And uh, <coughs> we went up to, to Diggs, I think I, Driggs. Driggs. I'm trying to say where I'm at. My deal's covering me up. Okay, there we are, Driggs. <coughs> and we stayed at Travel Club members for four days. And we ran into Grand Tetons and we ran up to Yellowstone to the west entry up here uh, from their house. And this is what it looked like the first morning when we woke up. There's the Grand Teton and there's an air balloon. And we're in their living room, eating, well, dining room, eating breakfast, looking at that. And Lanny and I drove on into Jackson, into Jackson Hole, because we went over to the Ansel Adams barn. And Ansel Adams made this barn famous with one of his black and white. It's one of the most photographed barns in the United States. And the Grand Tetons are in the back. 
and I've never been there that there wasn't two or three photographers taking pictures. And this was my day. I was like, well, I don't want the clouds there, but I really don't control that. So I, I shot the best I could. And, and oh, it said, looks great. But go ahead and look at the rest of the beauty there, because in the fall, the aspens are yellow. I just missed them by a little bit. But it's it's beautiful country in, in Grand Tetons. It's nice. Next day, we went up to West Entry, went over to Mammoth Falls and saw the West area. But uh, I'll get back to Idaho. Uh, we, we did enjoy Yellowstone, the geysers, and seeing that. But we'll get back on the route, and we're going to head right up this way, and we're just going to skirt the edge. Uh, Billy, uh, may yes. I ask you a quick question? Where was the Ansel Adams barn? Was that in Driggs? It, no. no, it is in the Grand Tetons. At the, you go to Jackson and then you go Southwest. to Jackson Hole. And when you get to the airport entry, you drive another half mile and turn right. And east. Turn east oh. and it's right there. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Anybody can tell you where it's at. Yeah, just about anybody can tell you. <laughs> and, and I'm going to take you up to Ashton. I'm going to show you Mesa Falls. Uh, very, very beautiful. But I mean, the, this wheat and barley production is mind blowing and just beautiful land everywhere. And the, the barley crop there set a record this year. They made uh, 65.1. I'm sorry, they made 110 bushels per acre on their barley this year, which is a record for them. And so that's, that's an amazing yield. It's almost twice what Texas makes. And uh, then they make a lot of hay and you can get no problem getting pictures like this at, during hay harvest. This was my first introduction to barn quilts. These are two full, uh, four by eight foot sheets put together, which makes a square eight foot by eight foot. And then you paint a quilt pattern on it and then you attach it to the side of your barn. And barn quilts have become extremely popular. When we travel, we see them everywhere. And uh, some of them are very, very well done. And so you can see these, but that's the first one I've ever seen it was up in Idaho. And we went up to Mesa Falls, and, and this is a beautiful stop. Highly recommend it. Uh, you can easily get that picture, shoot a tighter picture with that. And then that water drops and falls to the lower falls, and you just walk around, and you can shoot down at the lower falls at the, at the same location. And I'm going to show you. You see where this rock is right here? I'm going to show you how big this is. Here's a guy standing on it, and here's a guy on a kite. So that's <laughs> a big, big waterfall. And were were so, you tempted? No, <laughs> uh, but it, it's very, very nice. And we're going to drive on another scenic drive. Each of these yellow patterns are scenic drives, and we're, we're getting up into a little notch where most people would take off and head up north into Montana, going to Glacier, but uh, we're gonna show this, this general area. And I'm just gonna show you three or four pictures of, of mountain scenes. And you can just see mountains and lakes that, that just take your breath away. And like Jack said, he likes to do a little white water rafting. This one right through this channel here makes for some great opportunities to go on your white water raft. And uh, that was the area there. You uh, can see other areas. We were headed up to Coeur d'Alene and uh, we had a meeting there, a conference uh, uh, was right there at Coeur d'Alene, was right on the lake. This is the center we were staying at and looking right out back was this beautiful lake. You could rent your kayak, uh, go over, talk to the guy. It was more than $5 to go fly, but uh, <laughs> it, it was a very nice opportunity. 
And uh, from there, uh, you can go up here to Hayden and that, that is where the bird, B-Y-R-D, uh, Air Museum is. And from old shows of Dr. Kildare, you'd see them say, hey, bring me the bird. And they was talking about this respirator he invented. And look at the death rate drop once that was introduced into the, into the medical practices. Neonatal de deaths had dropped from 70% to less than 10%. And so quite, quite an interesting museum to go through. The guy had his airplanes there. He had his cars there. He had his ambulances there. Uh, no charge for us to go in there. It's all donation. And they give the donations to some charity. And uh, just a very nice uh, museum to go to. Uh, the guy's wife wanted a, a deal for the women that served in the Air Force, the WASP, and to recognize the bombers, the fighters, the transporters and everything. So they got the Women of Courage Memorial there. And this is not my picture. I wished I'd have been there that day because this ribbon was 20 feet off the ground. This female aviator has her plane upside down and she slices through that ribbon. And I'm like, wow, I would have loved to have had a chance to shoot that because that, that's an amazing shot, an amazing stunt itself to be that close to the ground. And then we uh, went over to uh, uh, Blanchard and Blanchard we stayed at a timeshare and we enjoyed that because we was at the fall color change and the yellows was intense and the reds were intense and you had no problem getting pictures like this. And uh, we were there August, September in that time frame, and uh, just, just things change uh, differently. And then we dropped down to Post Falls and for those that love pocket knives, this is where the Buck Knife Company is. And you can go from the start to the finish and learn how buck knives are made. And after you get through, you can go to the retail store and, and buy knives. And if they have little blemishes, they knock a pretty good price off of them. And they still keep their guarantee of lifetime sharpness. And so it, it's quite interesting to go through there. We left Coeur d'Alene, went down to Moscow, and you see where Washington is and Oregon is, and you're going through a farm area that to me was absolutely phenomenal. And the, the steepness of this land that they're farming, I'm just like, you couldn't get me on a tractor on this thing. And they're, they're to do this on combines, uh, they've adapted them. And you see this combine, it's got a head running at about 25 degrees. It's got the axles that you can adjust so that you can maintain a level floor for the grain to shake through and collect up in the bin. But you'd have to, this is very steep country. And uh, it, it was beautiful, beautiful country. Now from Moscow, you can drive about 60 miles over to this ancient cedar forest. Not very many of them in the U.S. anywhere. And, and you can tour that and, and enjoy that visit. And then uh, we drop down here to this area. And this is uh, Hell's Canyon. And Hell's Canyon, they were fishing right and left. There's a couple of hundred fishermen when we were there. And we enjoyed just driving through the, the area. It was gorgeous. Yeah. And... Uh, it just takes your breath away and you, you can see that this uh, sturgeon, pretty good sized fish, we was talking about that earlier. They said it's edible, but no, you probably don't want to do that. You probably want to take it, take a picture of it and let it go. And Jack's saying some of these may be as old as 200 years old, but they're, they're big fish. Everybody up there was, was looking for the steelheads, trout and and uh, they were catching plenty and showing them off. And I don't blame them. That's some pretty impressive 
fish there. You can go power boating there. That's more my cup of tea. I, I don't have to get too wet and still enjoy <laughs> the power that's going on. And, uh, you know, railroad lines running through. and That's the, the Pelusi, or Pel yeah, I'll say it that way, uh, production area. And, and it's, it's just very photogenic and, and uh, the opportunities there. This, I say, because I like this area, this is dead center of the state. It's got so many of these uh, scenic byways. You just see Salmon River Scenic Byway, the Salmon Byway, the, these you can see that there's lakes and, and pond, uh, lake and lakes and mountains and just really? yes. Are um are these by the scenic byways, are they like bumper to bumper cars or are they crowded or is it just depends on the day type of thing? Well, I'll answer that from the standpoint is if school's going on, it gets more crowded. I mean, school's out, gets more crowded. And, and remember, fall starts really early up here. It is not unusual to get snowed on in September. And so oh, okay. <clears throat> you go up there and, and uh, school started back. It's a lot deader. In, okay. Uh, in that area after at that time but i mean you start looking at these lakes you got the river fish uh lake creek waterfall uh beautiful mountain scenes that sawtooth back there it, you see the redfish lake and the sawtooth lake uh stanley lake i mean these are these are just gorgeous places to go to uh, at, this is Alice Lake, steep, rough mountains, complemented with the lake, Twin Lakes, this and that one, just very nice, and your Barron Lake. So ju just enjoy the, the area, enjoy your, I'd stay there at least three, four days, because you'd like to see the sun come up, the sun go down, and enjoy what's around there, and uh, Certainly worth the trouble. Then on your way out, just drop by Boise, see the state capitol. It looks like every other state capitol. And <laughs> uh, it's uh, got a Ann Morrison Park, very beautiful uh, there in Boise. And so you can uh, enjoy your meal or something that you buy and go eat at the picnic style there at the park. Another Mormon uh, temple there. And just several of those across the state. I didn't take you to the Craters of the Moon. It's there, just another stop along the way. Uh, you can go to, to the scenic byways and see beautiful sights just about anywhere uh, in uh, Idaho. So that's, that's my last picture. And uh, I hope you enjoy the trip. Hope you make it to Idaho. Well, can you put the map back or one, the one that shows the whole state? Can you kind of put that back? And then maybe if people have some questions, they would maybe remember where, you know, the map might trigger some things. Um, David did ask, um, how long was that trip? Or... Was this well, a conglomeration of that, trips? This this was a fall trip of 2015. We traveled 8,000 miles and we were gone three months. We spent about two weeks in Idaho. And uh, we spent uh, a week up there uh, north of Coeur d'Alene. We spent four days in Coeur d'Alene. We spent four days at Diggs. We spent a couple of days at Twin Falls. Uh, spent one day at Moscow, so you know, two weeks easy in Idaho, and, and you could spend a lot longer time than that. Uh, we actually went through uh, Yellowstone, uh, of course, it was down at Salt Lake City. Uh, we went up to Grand Tetons and on into Canada, 
up into Waterton and on up north to, to Bamp and on up to Jasper, then went across and went to Vancouver and dropped into Washington and Oregon and California. And so it was a pretty good trip. I guess. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, and uh, someone asked what kind of car, were you in a car? What kind of vehicle was, did you do this trip in? We, we always seem to travel in the Prius because in the mountain country, we'll get right at 50 miles to the gallon. And when we was driving across Canada, 50 miles to the gallon was a good thing to have because yeah, it, it's a lot more open country than, than even Texas. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was very good. Um, here's a question. Um, did you make it to Sun Valley? Uh, and wondering if the ski resorts were open to off season in the off season for other recreation. Usually when you get to places like uh, Sun Valley and things like that, they, you have a greater opportunity to get them as a timeshare, probably through RCI or such. And so I would say that, yes, it's probably an opportunity. Uh, it wasn't when we were there. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't that. The year we were there, it wasn't. But uh, we really enjoyed the one that we stayed in north of Coeur d'Alene. It was, it was very good. And we was only... 14 miles from Canada. We were trying to avoid the snow. I couldn't hear Lanny. We were trying to avoid the snow. Yeah, we were, we were trying to get out of there before it started snowing. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Does anybody else have... Um, those pictures were just gorgeous, Billy really really truly gorgeous yeah i agree beautiful pictures billy well the the presentation i have on wisconsin doesn't have any colorful pictures like that but i i do have that one finished now oh you do <laughs> wisconsin is wisconsin yeah <laughs> great state uh okay well, do you want to go back where we can see everybody and see if anybody has a hand raised uh, with something that a question they'd like to ask? Um, David, I don't know that I got all of your questions in, fit in, did I? Well, I, I was wondering uh, just a personal question. My wife and I have a timeshare uh, called Stone Ridge in Blanchard, Idaho. And I was curious if that was the one that he stayed at. Well, my wife is checking her notes and I'll answer that shortly. Okay. And what, uh, uh, what time, of, uh, when did your trip begin in uh, the fall? And, and then when did you return back to Dallas or to Texas? We left mid-August. We left mid-August okay. and I know it was we not. We got back before Thanksgiving. Yeah, we got right back right before Thanksgiving. Wow. And did you do you pretty much have your itinerary all set before you leave, or do you sometimes create some of it on on your way? Well, it, it our deal is like what you're saying is we travel 300 miles, shoot for that something like that, and then if we're staying with travel club members, we always ask them what do we need to do. We don't plan our itinerary tight. We just know we're going to be in this town and then we're going to be in this town. But if they tell us, you need to go over here and see this Indian museum, then we go see the Indian museum. And we're, we're pretty flexible in, in what we do. Well, you're All helping right. me a lot. Thank you. Here is a question. Um, how do you pack for long trips? <laughs> I don't know that you've ever seen a Prius where you lay it down for the passenger, but you've got, you've got about seven feet from the back of the driver's seat to the back of the car. And <laughs> when you unpack everything out of it, it fills up two full roller cars. 
And so <laughs> whenever we're traveling, we will go through seasons. So we may start out hot. And when we get home, it's cold. Because <clears throat> I know on this trip, when we got home, we went through Bryce Canyon and it was 28 degrees. It had snowed the day before and the wind was blowing 15 miles an hour and it was dogged cold where we were taking pictures and it didn't take us long to get out of the car and get back in. We just stepped out, shot some pictures, got back in. And so you had to have a full gamut of, of clothing to cover hot to cold. Yeah, you would. Um, well, I did want to ask Coleman, and I just saw he just got up and left his seat. <laughs> I wanted to ask him, hey, Cole. Hey, Coleman, <laughs> I have a question for you. So Cole lives in Idaho. And I just thought, was there anything that Billy didn't cover that you think our members might really enjoy? seeing while they're in Idaho. Oh, and there's Beth Ann. Hi there. I don't know if you all remember, Beth Ann gave us our presentation on COVID like a year ago. So <laughs> good to see you. Well, we, we just recently redrove across Idaho because we are we're Red Cross volunteers and we have uh, forest fires out here. So we just responded to one. Um, uh, about the only thing I think Billy did a superb job. I think the only thing I can think of, Craters of the Moon was good to actually stop there and see that that's an area where, where there was an active volcano and a big lava flow, and it was only 2,000 years ago. So, I mean, that whole area looks really raw, and it is um, uh, really quite something to see. Uh, even in Hawaii, I never saw anything quite like it. Um, let's see, you know, the, uh, Idaho is, um, you know, the north is all, uh, or the center to the north is all mountains and, and, uh, pines. And, and then down here toward the south, we've got, uh, more sagebrush, but still a tremendous amount of diversity and, and, uh, uh, fabulous lakes. And, and, uh, uh, I am very much looking forward to, uh, uh, hunting season this fall with my son-in-law. So, uh, and there's some fine hunting here. So, uh, uh, much to see. Well, great, great, thank you. Thank you. Um, I did have one other question. Do the parks, the state parks, all have entrance fees? And yes, you have do. to make reservations. Okay, the answer to that is yes and yes. The um, um, the state parks for camping. for camping, if that's what you're talking about, uh, you do need to make reservations. Idaho has a really, really wonderful uh, uh, reservation website, um, and uh, you know, so you can camp, uh, book your camping through there. Um, but as far as the individual uh, sites, the um, yeah, they they do a deal where it's it's. Um, the, the park pass for Idaho is $7 per visit or $10 for the whole year. So what are you going to do? You know? yeah. <laughs> whole year. Okay. Yeah. So, I, came over, I came over here on the Billy side of the computer. Um, <clears throat> when he told me that the meeting that year, and that's, we base our fall trip around wherever the meeting is. And it was in Coeur d'Alene. And I thought, why Idaho? And we fell in love with Idaho. It's just a beautiful, beautiful state. And I would go back anytime. It was, it just, it was beautiful. And, and that was Stone Ridge where we stayed up at Blanche. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. That sounds good. Well, um, the one thing you didn't mention in this, Billy, was what was your favorite restaurant or food? I'm sorry, I don't know the name of it. It, it, it was a little hamburger place that was. Uh, it was right across the street from that main resort there in Coeur d'Alene. We'd heard about it and we we're always looking for a good hamburger. And every, uh, good thing to know is you have to have cash, but they did have an ATM. 
And I walked back to get cash at the ATM. And by the time I got back, whoever we were sitting next to had paid for our meal. Oh, that's the sweetest thing. Yeah. Just a really nice man. That's a great story. Well, I think we'll end on that as far as the, oh, yes. I'm going to throw in one little thing about the very upper part of um, Idaho. Like the closest real town is Missoula, Montana. But up there is something called the Frank Church Wilderness. And it's about a million acres. And it has got, honestly, the best trout fishing in America, I believe. Now, that's just my opinion, but for cutthroat trout, it was whitewater rafting and fishing. And I spent a week there last summer doing that, and it was the best fishing trip of my life, period. You know, so um, if you think about that as something, but again, it's about a year, long, a year to make a reservation. So if you make it now, it'd be for next summer. And it is catch and release. Completely and, catch and release, yeah. And it's glamping. It's glamping. There, there. It is tent camping that other people put them up. Your meals are exquisite and all prepared. And um, it, it, I was not there. It was a guy's trip. And it sounds like it was just one more wonderful thing in Idaho. So Yeah, um, um, Kathleen's um, right. We were not roughing it. Far from we were, we were really having a you know it was a luxury trip and just a, a great place to go though so keep that upper upper part uh, south of Coeur d'Alene but kind of closer to the Montana side. Billy, thank you. That that was absolutely great. What year was your trip? Twenty fifteen. Twenty fifteen. The I, I, he didn't go into this. The Bird Museum. Uh, the Mr. Bird, he met his wife, and she was a, probably around 30 years younger she, than him. He met her at a, a conference out at Disney and courted her and went after her. <laughs> and I don't know how long they were married, but several years. Um, and he had just died within less than a month we were there. And we got to doing some research not too long ago. And she, she died in an airplane cat, uh, crash about two months after his death kind of sad but it, it was Very it was a beautiful, beautiful story wow billy what was the conference that you were uh, attended in port lane uh whoops you muted billy need to unmute uh, I worked for the, the Cooperative Extension Service in Texas, and the Cooperative Extension Service is in all 50 states. And so the professional organization meets different places once a year. And so like this year's meeting is going to be in Georgia. And so we'll plan our trip to Georgia. But it's extension professionals, all levels, uh, that we get together and, and – uh, Talk about how to be better extension professional. <laughs> and have a good time in, in, while you're doing it. Well, I, I think so. we need to Wait. go ahead and, and get I, on with our recipe. Wait, I think I need to know what the heck is an extension professional? All right, well. Uh... <laughs> Whoops, you muted. Get it again, okay. Uh, I'll try to explain it this way. You have the university structure and you have the research structure and both of those generate research information. But the average person can't understand all that generated data. And so it dumps into the extension service so it can get ground down and spit out where it's understood. And so that, that's what I, I did for 32 years for a career is make it where, oh, now I understand what you're talking about. I didn't get that uh, and this scientific is stuff. Culture that, that I understand. Is that right, Billy? What's that? Agriculture. It's agriculture oh. information. Ah. My, mine was soil and crop sciences, yes. It was what? Mine loves soil and crop sciences. Soil and crops, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Well, good. Every count, usually every county has extension services from, from the university. And so you can get information that is specific for that yeah. microclimate or, you know, that, that here in Colorado, um, there are so many different kinds of climates because of the elevation differences and, you know, so it's local information from the, from the bigger source and professionals and giving so, it to you. And so my okay. enrollment was in the state of Texas, there's 254 counties and with county agents, I served 62 counties as a specialist. Okay. That's on the federal level, isn't it, Billy? Federal, state, and local, yes. Very well, valuable I, I, service to the, to the farmer. Uh, I was born on a farm in Ohio, still have 40 acres of the old farm, and the extension service was very valuable. So thank you for that service. That's great. Well, I love the agricultural observations that you make about your trips. It, it's really fun to hear that because that's something that most of us don't know and wouldn't even maybe know to do some research on it. So thank you. Thank you again for that wonderful presentation. And I am actually going to remove the co-host from you and put it over to Stan and Sandra.